welcome to Marshall Amplification. The company as a, as a whole started back in 62, 1962. Jim then ran a music store, teaching drums above the store, selling sheet music, musical instruments, guitars, obviously. And people get coming in and asking him if he could do something about the amplifiers that were about, because in the early 60s, there weren't really any amplifiers that were for rock guitarists. Jim had people coming into the shop, such as the likes of Hendrix, Pete Townsend, saying they were trying to get the amplifier to give them the sound they wanted for their rock music. So Jim and his business partner found a designer called Dudley Craven, and they came up with number one. It was the first amplifier they produced, 30 watts, designed to be a play the lead or bass, but the difference to this amplifier to what was on the market at the time was due to this would overdrive, this you could cause it to distort, where amplifiers that came before it weren't designed to, they actively tried to stop it. So this one on the market on the sale in late 62, which is when the company started. For the first five years of the company's life, up until about 67, 68, it was literally you made week by week. So they'd buy the parts in from the amplifiers that sold the week before, build the amplifiers. For instance, the tag board would be manufactured on the kitchen table of, one of the actual one of the designers. The chassis and wooden box would be made in the back of the shop by Jim. And then Ken Brown, his business partner, and the designer, Dougley Craven, they would put them together and then sell them on the sort of weekend, as it were, Friday and Saturday. And that's how it went on for several years until eventually Jim was asked if he'd like to move the factory they'd started up to a new town. And so he was asked if he wanted to go to various new towns, look around. He came to Bletchley, where we are now, liked the idea and actually moved up in 68, 67, 68, up to Bletchley. And we've been here ever since. The factory itself, although it's changed over the years, is basically done in the same way. The particular amplifier number one, we still make something very similar to it, based on the same amplifier, called a 2245 or a JTM45. There have been changes over the years. I say this is a 30 watt. We now make amplifiers up to 100 watt valve, down to 10 watts transistor and the full range in between. The big changes that have done over the years have been down, have been happened probably every five or 10 years. When these were made, this is a basic amplifier, no, no real distortion other than by turning the thing up. So you, you have it flat out, you get the distortion. If you don't, you get it nice and clean. In the late 60s, early 70s, we came up with an amplifier that would distort at low volume. So you could actually, instead of having overdrive at 100 watts or 50 watts, you could have it at a lot lower level. This would give you the advantage of being able to use it in smaller gigs. So carrying on from the uh, JTM45, which came first, after five years, people were then saying to Jim that that's great, but it wasn't powerful enough. They wanted louder. So in 67, 68, we came up with what then became the 100 watt super lead, based tonally on the JTM45, but instead of using two power valves to give you your 30 watts or 50 watts of output, this now has four, which will give you that 100 watts this is now synonymous with Marshall amplification. Four real 34s delivering 100 watts into Something like you can see here, a 4x12, 100 watt head. This one happens to be in cream. Obviously, we do it in most colours these days. But this, this became the commonplace amplifier bought by rock bands and fans alike. We've been making this amplifier, say, so first one went out in probably 67, and we've been making it ever since and still make it today. It's still popular for the bands and for people who play larger gigs. The thing is with this particular amplifier, you need to have it turned up 
you need to have it at volume to give you that one wonderful warm distorted sound you get out of it this became not say an issue but became slightly problematic for some people who wanted that particular overdriven sound we can give them but at a lower level so in the early 70s we came up with what was then became the master volume which instead of having the four inputs and two separate volume controls it gave you two inputs high and low but then gave you a master volume as well as the preamp and this allowed you to wind the preamp up to give you preamp distortion but to the level that was more accommodating for your smaller gig and for people who didn't want you to play too loud the biggest change then after the master volume became the jcm 800 range which came out in the early 80s as you can see a combo in front this is a small 50 watt 1 by 12 combo the difference between that and anything we'd made really before it came with two channels you had your clean channel you had your overdriven channel the advantage of that is you could switch between them where with something like the normal super lead or the master volume go from high to low you had to switch between the high and low by unplugging the lead and plugging it in this one the ajcm 800 range was really the first range of amplifiers where you could actually switch between the two channels by using a foot switch it had other innovations we'd never done before things like an effects loop which would allow you to put your effects processor and or pedals into the loop giving you a better quality of sound in the sense you could add your reverbs your dist distortions if you wanted even though the amplifier would distort and delays reverb that sort of thing this particular amplifier this is the 50 watt version we actually finished up making 50 watt and 100 watt combos and obviously heads in both 50 watt and 100 watt what this gave the customer was a bigger variety of sound instead of being stuck if you like with a 100 watt head which sounded great flat out and gave you a really good rock sound with the advent of having two channels you could then go from your nice clean sound for your quiet bits if master level played quiet to the full overdriven heavy rock sound but at the flick of a switch this became very popular this particular amplifier this is the model number is the 4210 this is the biggest single selling amplifier we we made to date uh, we've sold thousands and thousands of these because it was really at the time when it came out in the 80s it was the first time we'd ever done as I say a two-channel amplifier giving you that warmth of a clean sound nice and smooth through to a heavy rock sound if you required it with the addition of it came with reverb the one thing that's probably stayed the same and solid throughout the whole of the life of, of basically my amplification is the 4x12 the 4x12 speaker this particular size both the angle and the straight is the same physical size was developed designed in 64 and it hasn't changed I say over literally over the last 50 years we produce it that size mainly people think it was originally designed acoustically to give you the right sound for the amplifier one of the initial design parameters as far as Jim was concerned when he designed it is when you put an amplifier on top it looks good I mean this one you can see it fits perfectly it's the right width to match with the amplifier that's one of the criteria you wanted it's the same with having the angled cabinet people think it's to help spread the sound on the stage no it's because it looks better it doesn't look like the amplifier's just sat on the top of a box it's actually slopes in subsequently having it angled does give you a better spread of sound and now if you're using the a cab it tends to project the sound over the top of the audience this gives a better spread but that's not one of the design criteria when it was first designed so all these speakers come and always have done apart from a very short space of time with celestian speakers these give you give us the sound we require and give the customer the overall sound they want they break up nicely they give you the overdriven sound you'd expect from a marshal 
We're talking about the JCM 900, another the range that came after the JCM 800. It looks very similar to the 800. This particular one is done so you can see what is how it's made. But the actual amplifier itself, you have a common tone circuit, but this one gives you input gain levels so you can have a volume control on the input channel uh, input and then a master volume so you can set both channels this comes as I say with the two channel it's either foot switchable or you can use it on the front this gives you a good clean channel and then an overdrive channel but the advantage of having the preamp and the master volume controls on both channels you can make the over the overdrive channel slightly more crunchy so if you're going to use it for rhythm for instance and you can also make the clean channel just have that little bit of an edge so if you're playing something a little bit harder so it goes not just a, a nice bright clean channel it will give it a little bit of an edge to the sound so it's a little bit more not I wouldn't say overdriven but that edge allowing you to play that certain type of music I say with this one after the 800 the 900 had a more sophisticated if you like effects input and output effects loop which is also controllable so you can actually vary the levels to match the more modern effects processes people uh, would use at this time in the 90s it also gave you it was the first amplifier we really did after silver jubilee which actually gave you a switch on there which allowed you to switch it in the case of this unit which is a 100 watt head you could switch it down to 50 watts so it literally it didn't switch the valves off what it actually gave you is all four power valves but at 50 watts and it was a true 50 watts so if you're playing a smaller gig instead of having all that volume that's slightly uncontrollable turning out the 50 watts makes it more controllable so you can still have the overdriven sound but nowhere near as loud it also gave uh, line outs so if you were using it in a, in a pub or a club that had a, its own PA, you could plug it straight into the PA. This may also gave you the advantage of maybe not using the amplifier quite as loud, but by feeding it the PA, you can have a, an overall sound that way. So that made it more versatile, which is what it's all about. As the company evolved, you go from the very basic amplifier, which gave you what you want, but only at a loud volume. And every time we bring out a new range from the 800 to the 900, and then to the JVM, it gives you the advantage of having more control over that particular sound, making it more versatile. We come on to what became the JCM 2000s. There were two in the range. This is the DSL 50, two channel, very similar to the JCM 900 in the sense it's got two channels, one tone circuit, two lots of controls, both preamp and master volume. The difference is with this one, it's even more, gives you slightly more features. Each channel has a button on there which allows you to go between two le gain, levels of gain on each channel. It also has shaping on the output of the amplifiers, the uh, sound in the sense you can fatten up. If you're playing at the big problem when you start playing at lower levels of volume, the amplifier can sound a bit thin, you can lose the bass this will give you a bass boost so you can fatten it up that way now again it has an effects loop on the back it also allows you to instead of selecting between the outputs so you can set whatever speaker cabinet it has just sockets on the back which allows you easier easier to follow what speaker cabinet you're going to use and what socket to plug into it so there again, it's very similar to the 900, if you like, very similar to the JCM 800. It's just the next generation. It's a smoother sound. It's slightly cleaner again, but the overdriven sound is more traditional, the more martial, I suppose you could say 80s overdriven sound, which is what people really love, but with all the modern traits of 2000. Having the effects loop on the back, it also has DI out, the, the effects loop is actually now on this particular one will give you the advantage of having two effects loops one for the overall out, uh, output of both channels or you can actually split it so you can have separate 
allowing you to have different effects on each channels. When we come to the 2000, which is what I'm sitting on, the triple super lead, as the name suggests, you now have three channels. Same as before, but now instead of going with just a single tone circuit, it now has split tone circuits. So each channel has its own tone controls. So where before with the DSL and with the 900, you are having to have a common tone circuit for both the overdrive and clean. This now gives you the advantage of being able to set the three sounds, your clean, your rhythm and your overdrive with their own tonal settings, which makes it a lot more versatile yet again. It also has the same fatness, so you can fatten up the bottom end when you're playing at lower levels. It also has a power reduction button. It doesn't actually turn the power stage down to 50 watts, but it gives a similar sort of effect. Still using all four power valves, but it lowers the actual, physically lowers the output and makes it a little bit more versatile. This also comes with a split effects loop. So you can have the effects loop on all three channels exactly the same, or you can have a different effects loop for the clean channel and then one for the overdrive channels, allowing you to switch between them. So you can have various effects affecting just certain, your, certain sounds you want. For instance, if you're having a clean sound, you may want more reverb on it to fatten it up. But when you're on overdrive, you may not want that reverb, so you can have it so you don't, the reverb is switched off because you're using the separate effects loop. It has the DI out, allowing you to feed straight into your PA. This one is a 2 by 12 combo. So you have the two Celestian speakers to give you the advantage of a small compact box, but delivering the full 100 watts if you require it. We're talking about the different ranges. This is the latest amplifier we make at the minute, which is the JVM 410. As I said, this comes, it's four channels, but as you can see from the front, you have 28 knobs on the front, one on the back. What this gives you over, say, the original number one, is a lot more variety of sound. With the, num with the number one or the, the standard JTM 45, you get the good overdriven sound, clean if you turn the guitar down. What this particular amplifier gives you, because you have the four channels, you have the advantage of being able to switch between all four channels. Each channel itself has four ranges of ga uh, three ranges of gain. So if you're on the clean channel, you have three levels of gain, so you can have it nice and clean through to a little bit more crunch. But you can, or you can go straight through to channel four, which you can use for thrash metal. It is that versatile. The, the idea behind it is that somebody can have this particular unit. We may make it as a head combo as well, but not in 100 watt, 50 watt combos. And this gives you the advantage of being able to go from a clean sound to an overdriven sound at the flick of a switch. What the advantage with that is that you can play all types of music. So if you're a, a one man band who play your local pubs or clubs, you can go from playing something clean like country and western through to playing Metallica at a flick of a switch. It has built in 12 sounds, but all these sounds are martial sounds. So in theory, and very easily, you can go from the JTM45 sound through to a 100 watt super lead, through to a master volume, through to something very clean. And this gives the advantage of being more versatile and will give you whatever you want. It looks complicated to start with, because you say there's 28 knobs on the front of there, but it has innovations on there that we've never done before. It's having the four channels, that's very straightforward. But you've got two master volume controls, for instance, and this allows you to set it for either playing at home in your bedroom or in your studio and they're having the same settings and going out and at the flick of a switch you can go to gigging level or you can use it whereby you're playing rhythm and then at the appropriate moment through the song you can press the button and go into the you know, your lead break 
And instead of having to go over and turn the volume up or, you, or rely on the guitar to turn the volume up, you can have it all preset on the foot switch. The advantage of that is, is fairly obvious in the sense you don't have a break in song, you don't have to think about what you're doing other than what foot switch, what button you have to press on your foot switch at any one time. It makes it easier. As we talked about the, the uh, ranges of amplifiers through the generations, if you go back to the beginning, as it were, back to the 62, producing the JTM 45, one thing that people started to ask us for after a year or two was could we do it in a combo? That's why this was born. This is a, a 1962 blues breaker. This particular one is actually a 1961 blues breaker. We only did two versions. This one is actually a four by 10. So it's got four 10 inch speakers in instead of the more standard two 12 inch speakers. But electronically it's identical. To look at it, it's exactly the same as would be a JTM 45 or a 100 watt super lead or a 50 watt super lead in the sense you have four inputs, a lead channel and a bass channel. But the, adult, the advantage of this is it comes with tremolo. So now you have an, uh, uh, an effect which allows you to cause tremolo on one of the two channels. We did this because it was combo, so we thought it sounded better. This started off just as the model number, say, in 1961. The reason it's called or got the nickname as Blues Breaker, which is what it's, uh, everybody calls it, is because it was used on uh, by Cream and Eric Clapton on the Blues Breaker album. And then it was given the nickname. Why? I don't know exactly why, but that's because we love that album. It became known as the Blues Breaker uh, um, guitar amplifier. And it's stuck, and it's still what it's called now. Everybody calls it a blues breaker. Nobody calls it a, a 1962 or a 1961. That's what it's called. But I say it's, a, it's still, even as big as it is, it's still only a 31 amplifier. This particular version of the 1962 we still make today. So 50 years down the line, we're still making exactly the same amplifier. People ask why. The reason we make them now is because people still want them. They're a, an amplifier in demand. People like it. It's not very versatile. If you talk about the modern JVM 410 with all its knobs and all its different channels, it's a lot more versatile. What this gives you is a solid Marshall sound from the 60s. So people buy it because you can get that. I mean, the first thing most people do with these particular amplifiers is put a distortion pedal in the front end. So you can use it as a rock amplifier if you want to. But it also gives you that wonderful, smooth, valve-driven power stage sound that you can't get really on any other way. At least I don't think you can, my humble opinion. So that's when the first combos of this sort of size were made, say 64 onwards. And since then we've made various versions over the years. And obviously as you've seen, the JTM 800, the first one in that range was a combo. All the other ranges we have combos. They're very, they're actually probably almost as popular, if not more popular now, than a standard amplifier because it's that much more easier. Instead of wheeling in your four by twelve in your head, you're carrying one of these. Although you're going to be strong to carry in one of these, and you set it up, and everything's there, and it's so much easier. You haven't got all the leads to worry about. It's all plugged in. In the case of this, there is a foot switch that allows you to switch the tremolo on and off. But that's all you can do if you want to go from the beat bass channel to lead channel <coughs> excuse me you have to move the guitar lead over what people tend to do or have done with these particular amplifiers as you would with the 100 watt super lead because it has two channels four inputs they link the two channels together a small patch lead and it gives you both the lead sound and the bass sound so it fills the sound it doesn't give any more volume but it gives a bigger warmer sound as you can see yeah. we're in the museum what we've got here is a display of some of the units we've made over the last 54 years. You've got this one, which is a PA. You told them what you want in the shop when you went to buy it and they, they changed the bits that are necessary to give you what you want. So you can walk out of the shop with the whole band. Suit the, guitar, the lead guitarist, the bass guitarist, the vocalist and the organ organist if you have one in your band. And that's what people did. And they had this, and that's what it started with. These are the same idea, but this is now is a two, tuba 12. 
and this is actually a 50 watt that's a little 20 watt this is actually a 50 watt but now it's got four channels not two which gives you a bigger chance to plug the lead guitarist in there the bass guitarist the vocalist you have two channels because he's greedy so it, then you could have just one amplifier would do the whole band it's only just if you like from the 80s onward when the big mega bands really came in that you had people having you know going to a a venue and there'd be 30 40 000 watt pa and all the heads on stage but when they started when we started in 60s until people like hendrix and the who had the big back lines most people just used to use a single head and it could almost do the whole band and as i said about if you move across and we said uh, say about the 4x12 the 4x12 itself as i said developed in 64 round 64 hasn't changed much but there have been variations you can see there that's actually what hendrix would have used it's a hendrix stack the the base cabinet was actually about eight inches taller what's that 20 centimeters taller than a standard 4x12 because the extra height gave extra spread we've also made I mean you can just see in the background here that's an 8x10 that was developed for bass so you had eight 10 inch speakers designed to work with bass but that would have been a 50 watt or 100 watt bass amplifier it wasn't the big these days it wasn't three or four thousand watts it was literally just either a 100 watt or a 50 watt valve and that's what people used in various versions that's actually an original one that comes from the early 70s and then you go across I mean the combos this is actually a, um, a would have been a, a silver jubilee which is developed in marketed in 87 this is actually came in slightly later than that because it has the gold front panel but that's a single channel amp but with two levels of gain which you can switch so it's not quite a two channel amplifier it's a single channel amp but allowing you to switch between two levels of gain that was the first amplifier the very first amplifier where you had a switch on the front you could turn it down to half power it was only in the jason 900s when the full range it became more popular but this was actually was in 87 was the first amplifier we did that had a high power so you could switch a 50 watt down to 25 watts or the 100 watt down to 50 watts another JCM 800 and obviously the blues breaker right. on this side of the museum there's a few different amplifiers if we start with this particular combo here this is what we've done or what we started to do we started to do what we call signature amplifiers these are amplifiers that are used by a particular guitarist in the case of this one is Paul Weller he used to use he still uses this style of amplifier which is a 2 by 12 combo and so we did a signature amp and what we mean what I mean by that is for a limited number we produced they looked slightly different to any normal amplifier in the case of this one electronically it's the same as any normal amplifier of this type but it comes with this one's got the bullseye on which is his signature finish We've done amplifiers over the years for the likes of Zach Wild, Kerry King, obviously Slash, and they all have their own different ways of having it. But they're all amplifiers that they've used, and we produce them as a limited run, allowing them to, it gives them a little bit more notoriety. We then work down the line. This one here, which is blue, this is actually our 30th anniversary. This was the first amplifier we decided to make that it's a three channel amplifier but it's deliberately made to sound like the amplifiers that came before it so within it you've got the JCM 45 you've got the JCM 800 you've got the JCM 900 sounds and so it means you could buy one amplifier that in theory would give you the essence of everything that came before it next one it's a standard the the 4 by 12 at the top is actually an old 4 by 12 dating from around sort of 71 72. i don't know if you can see the amp at the top it's actually called a knob the reason it's called a knob is the surname of the gentleman who started the company with jimmy's business partner was ken brown 
And the way I was told the story was that they were sat around having a few drinks one night and they thought about, you know, what can we do for something different? And so they produced a very limited number with bran backwards, hence the name Narb. Um, there are only, to my knowledge, there's only eight of those exist. We have one. I know where one other is. The other six, I have no idea. The only peculiar thing about that is that they say there was only eight made. That's number 11. So where, whatever happened to the other ones, I don't know. We have a different cabinet again. It looks very different. It's still the size of a 4x12. You've got a PA head on top, but that is actually a 1x12. And that was developed in the middle to late 70s. We started to make transistor amps as well as valve. The idea being to produce a transistor amp is actually obviously cheaper because you haven't got the expensive transformers. And so we did a range of those, and that was one of the speaker cabinets. To make it look unique compared to a standard 4x12, it was done like that. Uh, I've only ever seen two of those. That one came up and I bought that one. Well, the company bought that one. So it's just that little bit different. This here is actually a, a slash signature set. It's the full stack, is if, if you like. You've got the slash head on top. Then you have the two cabinets. Now, the cabinets themselves are standard 4x12s fitted with vintage 30 speakers. That is no different. It's just the logo on there is actually Slash's own logo. So you've still got the Marshall sound, but you have his own logo on the top. We're stood in the corner of electronics. As you see as we go around, we make everything ourselves. The boards themselves come in blank. We load all the components in. These are then tested and then put into the complete amplifier. So if you can come around here, you can see we have a series of amplifiers here. These are actually the JVM410. If I pick one out, you can actually see it's the whole, this is actually the valve board. You've got all the valve bases on the top. This is actually the Satriani version. So the components themselves are fitted in two stages. Half of them are fitted by auto insertion by machine. The rest are then fitted by ladies. They will load all the hand, the larger components. They then get flow soldered. And once they're flow soldered, they're tested to make sure everything's in the right place. And if they pass, or when they pass, they come down to here. This is an order. The guys will then take the chassis, which has come down from our engineering department. They will put that together. They'll take the chassis, they'll put the whole amplifier together. So you take the bare chassis and the circuit boards, they'll put them all together, put all the transformers, front, back, front and back panels, the whole unit will then be put together. In the case of a JVM410, it's about 18 minutes to put all the components into the circuit boards, and then a further 35 minutes or thereabouts to build the amplifier, the chassis. So it's about an hour for a JVM. Now at this point, we don't plug a guitar into them because it's just too noisy. What we tend to do, they're plugged into a computer. A computer will feed in the guitar signal and tell the operator what to do. He will turn the controls, volume, bass, everything, test all the switches. At the end of it, it'll either pass or fail. If it fails, it tells the operator what's wrong with it. Most of the time it tends to fail for the things that it tends to fail for, I should say, are valves. It will test the level of the valves, make sure the gain's right, they're not noisy, and to make sure everything's plugged in properly. From there, it will then go off into our finishing department. So they will take all the bare bones of an amplifier and put the whole thing together. You saw the circuit boards for the JVM, where the auto insertion puts a certain amount in, 50%, and then the rest are fitted by ladies. What we also manufacture is this which is totally hand-wired, point-to-point wiring if you like. This particular board is for a 1974X, which is a little 18-watt 1 by 12 combo. As I said, with the JVM, to load those 500 components into the four circuit, circuit board takes about 18 minutes. This has 39 components, and it takes one person about an hour and 20 minutes to do. The board itself comes in empty, so you'll put the rivets on, 
done all the wires, and then put all the components on by hand. Once this is done, it will then, you get a chassis. This is actually a blues breaker. You'll take this chassis, it will come up from engineering. They'll put all the bits and pieces on the front panel, back panel. This one has been started. You can see it has the transformers in there. Once it's finished, it'll be married up with the appropriate circuit board or tag board, depending on what it is. And then we'll then get hand wired. This is literally done by hand. In the case of the JTM45 or the Blues Breaker, it takes about five, five and a half hours to build one of those units, where with the JVM, it's about an, an hour. They take a lot longer because they're done by hand. So you've seen the tag ball being manufactured. Now you've got the chassis. The chassis is actually, this is actually an Astoria, one of the newer amplifiers. The chassis has come up from engineering. It's had all the transformers and everything else fitted. It then comes to one of the wirers. And as you can see, she's taken the amplifier and wiring the whole thing up. It's done by one person. She will get this amplifier with no wires on. She'll, as you can see, at the minute she's doing the AC, the heater's on the amplifier itself. She'll then go onto the circuit board or the tag board. This particular unit will take probably around five hours to be put together. So you've got an hour for the hour, hour and a half for the circuit board, and then five hours to wire it. This is quite normal. This is what people want. These particular amplifiers are the high-end amplifiers. You're looking at two, three thousand euros for one of these. But it's done in exactly the same way as it was in 62. The only difference now, in 62, it would have been done by Ken Brand or Ken Flegg, and they would have done it in the back of the shop. But there's no difference. You see, done in exactly the same way. The wires these days are different colors. It makes it easy to wire, plus it meets all regulations. But there is no single difference. What we're standing in front of is the flow solder machine. Now, most of the circuit boards, as you've seen, they're, they're a proper circuit board, so they have the components fitted on and they needed soldering. Now, you could do that by hand, but you're talking you know, 20 minutes per circuit board. You just can't do that. So what we stood in front of is what's called a flow solder machine. In the vat, you have about eight, nine liters of liquid solder sitting at 260 degrees centigrade. The circuit board is put in at the other end and it comes up, it's sprayed with flux, which you need to to make the solder run properly. It then, the board has to be warmed up to make sure you get a perfect solder joint. So it goes to what's called a preheater, which warms it up. And then when it comes to where the, the solder is, you get what's called a wave. It's a wave solder machine, so as the name suggests, you get a wave of solder, and the circuit board just touches the bottom of the solder. The solder touches the bottom of the circuit board, I should say, which solders the whole thing. So a board that would probably take 20 minutes to solder takes about 12 seconds to get a perfect solder joint. We do this to make sure we get a perfect solder joint. Just now, where the centre, there you go. As you can see, it's actually going through the wave of solder. You can just see it on the edge. The whole circuit board now has been soldered. It will then switch off until the next circuit board comes up. There you go. And that's finished. Now it's all perfectly soldered. So now you've got the circuit board we've just seen go through. And it's all soldered on the back, ready to be tested and then fitted into the amplifiers.
Unfortunately, due to health and safety reasons, we're not allowed any further. But as you can see, all the cabinets, once they're built, come to this end. They're all hand sanded to make sure they're perfectly smooth to take the covering. And when the, when the order is fulfilled, they will then go on to a carousel where the units are then warmed, sprayed with the glue and covered. It's where the fret is fitted. The bits of wood cut to size, cut to shape, and then come to here. And as you can see, they're all fitted by hand. The art of this is to make sure you stretch the material just enough to make sure there's no creases, but not too tight so it has an effect on the sound. It's all, hand, it's all done by hand and done by eye. You actually pull with just enough tension. What happens now, once the frets been fitted, these are fronts to amplify it, it then has to have the logo fitted. This, the holes have been pre-drilled, he's put them in there, he will now fit the logo. The spline shaft, so all you do is literally tap it in with a hammer. It is that simple. Lines up the holes, lines up the six pins holding the, that hold the name in place. Simple as that. Once the boxes come out of the wood mill, they're warmed, sprayed with glue, and then have to have the covering fitted. The covering itself is all done by hand. As you can see one here, the unit's been covered, glued and wrapped. Now it's actually been fitted. What you have to do is put the right amount of tension on the unit, as you'll see now. It's a, what's called an impact adhesive, so you just richly rub it on there and it will stay. As you can see there, it's just literally... It looks very... they make it look very easy. It's not. I've tried this. It's not easy. It's just he's done so many and do it so quickly. You have to make sure it's properly fitted. You can't stretch it too much because it will shrink back. It's all down to tension. It just works its way round, side at a time. This is the critical bit, the bit I could never get right. Is to make sure that edge is perfect. This is our engineering department. As I said at the beginning, we make everything ourselves. So what we've got here they stamp all the chassis out. So we start with flat bit of steel. It's all, apart from three of them, are all made out of mild steel. Most of them are now made out of what's called Zintex, which is just steel covered in zinc. And the machine by the side of us will actually start working in a second. You'll be able to see the machine moving back and forward, stamping all the holes into the unit. The chassis we can see being stamped out is actually a JVM 410, the unit we saw at the beginning and through electronics. All the holes are literally now being stamped. Once it's finished it gets cut into size and then we'll get bent so then you would recognize it as a normal chassis. This is final test and quality control. As you can see, Mark will take the amplifier, which has come through. In this case, it's a 4x12, uh, one of the new Silver Jubilee. When it comes in, there's basically three jobs it has to do. Make sure it's clean and tidy. It is a work environment. You can get dust on it. All the benches where the units are put together have carpet on there, so it doesn't damage the material. But, of course, carpet can get dust in it. Once he's happy with that, he'll then check it's all there. Now, it sounds a peculiar thing. What I mean by that is to make sure there's no screws missing, no rivets missing. 
it's got four speakers in the case of a 4x12. And once he's happy with that side of it, he'll give it an electronics test. 4x12, the 4x12s we make now have a switch union on the back which allows you to have either four or 16 ohms in mono or eight ohms in stereo. So you can have different combinations of amplifier. So we have to make sure that's wired correctly, but that doesn't tell you whether the speakers are wired. It just tells you whether they're, they're wired correctly, but not in the right phase. So once he's happy with that side of it, he will then give it a, a quick guitar test. As I say, everything that comes through here has a guitar plugged into it. People think, what a great job. Well, it is actually quite a good job. Mark enjoys it. But he doesn't get to play very much, at least not when we're walking around. It's a very quick test. As you'll hear now, it literally all it is is a strum of the guitar on the bottom E, for instance, to make sure the speakers aren't rattling or buzzing. That's literally the test. Obviously, if you were testing uh, something like the JVM we spoke of before, which has got 28 knobs on the front and 12 buttons, all those knobs and all those buttons have to be turned. They take slightly longer. And anything with a combo in it, and so what I mean by that, anything that's got an amplifier and speaker together, it actually goes up and down the scale to make sure there's nothing going to rattle or buzz. Providing it passes all that, it will then go off to its appropriate country. That one we've just seen, that's going somewhere in Europe. We don't know where. The computer does, but we don't know exactly where. So that will go off and the next one will come in. And so it carries on.